Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I brought back Devin Burke. We talked about lifestyle and insomnia a few years back, episode 256, if you want to check that out. Today, we're diving into how the mind can interfere with your ability to sleep. Devin helps exhausted insomniacs get and stay asleep so they can wake up with more peace, power, and presence. He's a best-selling author, TEDx speaker, renowned sleep coach, and founder of the Sleep Science Academy. Devin was named one of the top 10 coaches in 2023 by USA Today and also one of the top 25 health coaches in America. He studied innovative holistic coaching methods from some of the world's top health and human performance experts for over a decade. And today, we're going to dive into how being overly focused on sleep as a problem and how you're thinking about it can really be what's keeping you awake and keeping you from quality sleep. This one is definitely a twist on what you would think when it comes to getting quality sleep. So let's reintroduce you to Devin Burke. Devin Burke, welcome back to the Health Fix Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me back. It's been a it's been a couple of years. It has been. So many things have changed. And, you know, one of the things that that actually has changed is I'm getting older, of course, and I am starting to notice some of the hormonal sleep things that happen as we get older. And so many women my age and, and men, too, you know, in their mid 40s, they start to be like, oh, my God, it's night's coming. Night's coming. Am I going to sleep tonight? What's going to happen? What do we do? Well, where do we start in, in this department? Because you and I were just chatting about how sleep is is not a problem. It's a result. And we we really focus on it as being a pro- the problem. So give us. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. Let's start with why that actually creates a problem. Focusing yeah. on sleep like it's a problem. One of the things I realized after working with thousands of individuals is that when we look at sleep like it's a problem, it creates pressure, mm-hmm. pressure to solve it, to figure it out, to, to do something about it, to try to control it, to try to force it. And sleep's the one, the one thing, one of the few things in, in life that the hard, I find the harder you try to control it or force it or manipulate it or make it happen, the less it happens. And it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. Uh, cause you know, people are like, well, I, I get that I'm not sleeping as well. I want to do something about it. And then what I find people do is they try to do all these things. It creates all this pressure, all this sort of energy or anxiety or f- frustration or fear or all this kind of pressure. And that just pushes sleep further and further away. And so, you know, right before we, we started recording, I was saying, it's not just what you do. It's how you think about what you do that makes the difference. And it's so true when it comes to sleep. So true. So it's, there's not, there's definitely things you can do to improve your sleep. And one of those things is seeing sleep as a result versus a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a subtle mindset shift, but it makes a huge difference because it can kind of take the pressure off. And then you can start to get curious and explore, well, okay, what is going on that has my body not doing the most natural thing in the world? The thing that we were born to do sleep. And how can I support my mind, my body, um, my whole system to just have sleep happen and happen in a natural way that doesn't involve, you know, all of this, all these things and just get that deep, refreshing, restorative sleep that we need. And here's the thing. Going through menopause is a challenging time for sleep. That's just what it is. And there are things you can do for sure. Um, Another really challenging time for sleep is people that have young kids. I get people, you know, if you're a young mom or dad, like you can expect your sleep is going to be thrown off. Like that's, those are like the two times in life that you're almost guaranteed to have um, less sleep and probably less quality sleep. And the good news is they both pass. Right. Yes. The that is that is the good news. That is the good news. Getting you there though, that is 
that's the part that, you know, becomes becomes tricky because I know a lot of people, especially in the women's health space, we start to see weight going up. And and so many folks have, have touted the, well, you're going to gain weight if you're not sleeping. And so now we add another, right, anxiety yes. level in yeah. I'm going to get Alzheimer's. I'm going to gain weight. I can actually feel like I'm, I feel the weight gaining on me because I'm not sleeping as much or as deep. And it's like, oh my God, I need to sleep because I don't sleep. I'm going to continue to gain weight. I'm going to have a higher chance of Alzheimer's dementia. I'm going to have a higher chance of heart attack. I'm going to, you know, age faster, you know? So it's like, what does all that do? It creates more anxiety, more pressure to figure it out, fix it, solve it, get to sleep. And that creates less sleep. I, I can I can honestly say you're you're on point here because all the times that I've worked with patients intensively on trying to dial in the sleep, you know, sometimes it'll work and it's all good. And other times there's those cases where like nothing works and they have, oh, and I'm embar embarrassed to even say like some folks have like their regimen of like it's like it's like playing bingo, right? You've got your little trinkets that are like your good things that, you know, that gives you the good juju for sleep. And so instead they've got this regimen of like eight supplements. And they're like, if I don't take them, I'm not gonna sleep. You know, my good luck charms are right here. Yes. Do you see that often? Often. It's far too often. It can become like again, so like not to say that there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with taking supplements. Great. We need magnesium. We need, you know, it might be great to use kava or L-theanine or some of these things to help our nervous system rebalance or support our adrenal glands. There's nothing wrong per se with using supplements to support the body. But again, if we're thinking about it, like I need these or I won't sleep, that's a tra that's an issue because number one, it's not true, and number two, it creates you're you're giving your power into a supplement, and it, you could you could take a supplement and, and say a sleeping medication. You could take sleeping medication or supplement out, and you could say sleep hygiene routine. Like some people are so hygienic, they're mm -hmm. overly sleep hygienic, where they literally their their bedtime routine starts at eight o'clock, and if they don't get their hot Epsom salt bath by nine thirty they know for a fact that they're not going to sleep, right? So it becomes this almost like orthorexia where people yeah. just are hyper, hyper obsessed with sleep. And I get it because, you know, I know how I feel when I don't sleep well. I'm sure you know how you feel when you don't sleep well. Right. We know how important sleep is. So it's on this pedestal and the challenge, it deserves to be on a pedestal, but the, the issue with that is then again, that putting on a pedestal creates so much more pressure, creates so much more focus. And, and then though I find that that's the very thing that gets in the way from sleep happening. We can't, it's, it's, it's crazy. But once you see it, you're like, oh, I get it now. I get it. It makes perfect sense. So that leads me to the question, because of course you focus on sleep. How do you, how do you not focus on it, but focus on it and make it all come <laughs> You know, how does the sleep yeah. science Academy work <laughs> to yeah. not focus on it, but focus on it? What's the oh trick there? What's Such the Such a good question. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this work is there's a lot of mystery and a lot of paradox. That's one of the things. So like people come to us and they're like, okay, I'm in this program because I've tried all these things. These things haven't worked. And I see the results are getting, and it's about sleep. And we're, you know, we guarantee a result, right? And you're learning all these tools to help get a result, sleep. And so there is a bit of a paradox there where people are where they're saying, okay, we're focused on improving sleep, but we don't want to overthink it. So what we try to do is really help people understand the underlying patterns that create the loop in the first place. And one of the most amazing tools, something that I had no idea would be so powerful for people is actually practicing acceptance. And it sounds so simple, but when people really get this, when you're like, okay, let's say you wake up in the middle of the night and you wake up and your mind's starting to go and you're, you know, you're like, oh man, here we go again. And you start thinking about tomorrow if I don't get sleep or the time that you have to get up and you start to kind of feel a little activation. So, you know, you, you, you get yourself out of bed. That's the first thing. The next thing you, you, if you could do is actually accept, fully accept that you are awake. 
not making a story about it, not, you know, resisting anything, the pain that comes along with that. If you could fully get to a place of acceptance, what happens is the intel there's an intelligence in our bodies and the body wants to sleep. It knows how to sleep. If you in that place of yes, okay, it is what it is. There's, there's nothing I can do really to change this right now. I'm just going to be with it. All of a sudden, the body remembers how to get back to sleep. And that is a practice. It's not a strategy. It's not a tool. It's a way of being. And when you can understand how to be that way, be in a place of just accepting what is, and I know it kind of sounds overly simplistic, when people understand this, it's amazing. It's like a miracle. The body just gets back to sleep. And so that's a big part of our focus in our program is helping people give people the understandings and the practices to get to a place where no matter what is happening, they're able to get to a place of acceptance. And in that place, sleep happens. There's also some really important understandings around the psychology around sleep that I think people miss. <laughs> One of them, we call them the three Ps, perfectionism, problem solver, and the pedestal. We kind of touched on a couple of them already. <laughs> but those three Ps, if you're looking at sleep like it's a problem, if you're putting sleep on a pedestal, and usually people that have sleep challenges, they're kind of perfectionistic. They're usually really empathetic, really intelligent people. They care a lot. Um, you know, they're, they're, those are the types of people that tend to, you know, want to do things right. Those three Ps usually have people experience challenging sleep. And so when you can, on, when you can start to see, okay, which, which P am I, or my, my, my all three Ps. I'm like, you can I'm start three. To, yeah. I mean, most, yeah. See, see so, so you probably, I mean, this is the truth. It's so funny when people go through that training, that specific training, and we kind of unpack these patterns and help them understand them at a deeper level. All of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. I understand it now. I get it. I get it. And so again, that's, we're changing, not necessarily, we're changing a little bit about what you're doing, but when you change how you think about what you're doing, then all of a sudden things change. And that's a big part of the work that we do in our programs is we give people tools. There are guidelines and certain things, mistakes, big mistakes that we can talk about here that people make that seem like they would actually help, but in reality, they hurt. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about what those mistakes are. Um, you stop making those mistakes. You start to underline. You start to understand the underlying psychology around what keeps you stuck, and then you start to practice acceptance. Sleep happens. Hmm. We do that. There's a lot more to it, but that takes you know over eight weeks through that process, through getting the support, understanding these tools, techniques, and ways of being. That results in sleep. Fascinating. Fascinating that it all comes down to thought process. But I'm I'm super curious. You hooked me in on mistakes. Yes. What what are the mistakes people are making? Because I'm sure people are like, okay, I've identified, I mean, I identify with all three of the P's. So I'm like, hmm, what am I doing wrong? What yeah. So do you want to unpack the P's or do you want to because those aren't the mistakes? They're just like some underlying patterns that then have people try to force or control their sleep, which is one of the mistakes. So I guess that kind of leads us into it. Yeah, yeah. Let's unpack them and then we'll we'll flow right in. Yeah, let's okay. do that. Yeah, so we'll do it in, a, in a, an effective, efficient way. So we already kind of talked about why looking at sleep like a problem, what that creates. That creates more pressure, creates more expectation, that creates less sleep. So we want to understand that sleep is a result, it's not a problem. What, so what's if there is a problem, what's the problem? Well, it's my relationship to sleep. It's what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. So the second P is let's look at the perfectionism. In what ways are you trying to make your sleep perfect or overly focus on your sleep? So this could be all the things around, okay, I need, I feel like I need to take these supplements. I feel like I need to have a cold, dark room. I feel like I need to X, Y, Z, anything you think you need in order to sleep. We want to, we want to start to identify, well, is that really true? Do you really need that? Yeah, it might help you sleep. Yeah, it might help you get deeper quality sleep. Sure, there's science around that. But do you really need to do it? So identifying the ways in which you're trying to perfect sleep or control sleep, really important. And usually they're pretty similar for most people, but for some people, they, those, those kind of things are, are unique. 
Mm -hmm. And then the pedestal pattern, it's in a lot of times when people are not getting sleep, they blame everything on sleep. And so we try to open it up to, well, is it possible? Is it possible that it's not just your sleep that is you know, creating the fatigue or the exhaustion or the brain fog. Yeah, sure. That's not helping. I get that. But is it possible that there's some other things going on that maybe you're not aware of? Maybe you are aware of them that it's not sleep is just it, it, sleep is not the golden standard. Like if you are sleeping, all the other things are fixed. Maybe, maybe not. So really starting to unpack, you know, in what ways do we put it on a pedestal and what ways is not, not helpful and sort of un unwind all that stuff. So that's kind of, I mean, that's a s over simplistic, like short version of unpacking the peas, which leads us into the mistakes. The mistakes, biggest mistake people make. One of the biggest mistakes is they spend too much time in bed, not asleep, which you think, oh my gosh, if I need, if I'm not getting enough sleep or enough, enough quality sleep, I need, to, I need to spend more time in bed. Makes perfect logical sense. It's the complete opposite of what you need to do. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Okay. Because yeah, most people would be thinking, and and myself too. Like, well, if I just lay here, but then I can see the negative connotation too, where it's like bed equals sleep, but I'm not sleeping and I'm in bed. You're Is anchoring a hundred percent. You're anchoring wakefulness, and then I always get the question: Well, if, if I get out of bed, then there's no chance then I'm going to get back to sleep or there's no chance that I can even sleep because now I'm out of bed and I'm somewhere else and I'm doing what you told me, Devin, which is go to a place and have a plan not to get back to sleep, just to do it because it feels good. There's a really important distinction in what I just said there. Because if you're doing something to get back to sleep, you're trying to control or manipulate it. You're trying to force it. Mm -hmm. Do things just to do them because they feel good, not so that you get back to sleep. Very important distinction. If you're doing anything to get back to sleep, there's an expectation, there's pressure, even subtly, subconsciously, your body's going to respond to that. Cortisol, adrenaline, neuroadrenaline, even in the slightest little bit can be enough to keep the body up. Hmm. So you want to get out of bed. You want to get out of bed. And again, this is kind of a, a guideline. And mostly for people, this is when they wake up in the middle of the night, they, they're, you know, they're able to get to sleep and then they wake up, maybe it's two, between two and four, four o'clock in the morning. Generally, that's sort of where people end up waking up. Mm -hmm. You wake up. Okay, you realize you're up. You realize your mind's kind of going. You kind of feel a little restless, maybe a little uncomfortable. Maybe you hear your partner snoring. You start thinking, oh, man, I'm not going to get back to, oh, what time do I have to get up? How much time do I have, right? You start thinking about, oh, the next day is going to be really hard because if I don't sleep, I'm going to feel tired. I'm not going to be able to do X, Y, Z. It's going to feel, it's going to be painful. Mine starts to go. Uh -huh. Okay. Soon as you realize that that's going on, if you're not able to fall back to sleep within about 20 minutes, for some people, maybe 30, for some people, maybe less than 20, you want to remove yourself from the bed and bedroom, go to a low lit place and then have a plan. And the plan could be reading, stretching, praying, making a cup of tea, knitting, puzzles, listening to music, doing whatever would feel, you know, relaxing, boring, um, <laughs> would feel good. Doesn't matter what it is. People are always like, well, tell me what to do. I'm like, well, listen, what do you, what, what feels appropriate for you? Because who am I to tell you what to do? I don't, I don't, you know, it's, everyone has their unique thing that they do. For me, I'll tell you on the nights where I struggle, with sleep, which are rare, but they do happen. I, I get a book. I make a cup of tea. I get a book and I just read the book. And then when I start to feel sleepy, you just go back in bed and let sleep happen. And that's it. And it might take you, you might have to get up. You might get back in bed. You might feel sleepy. You might get back in bed and all of a sudden, boom, you're up again. Your mind's racing. And just kind of, you know, at that point you want to be in bed for, you know, again, feel into it. And if after you're like really activated, go back to your place, begin again. So that's a big, you know, people have so much resistance around what I just said, doing it. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, especially if you're someone that has an issue with maintenance, 
insomnia or, you know, waking up in the middle of having a hard time getting back to sleep, it works. And now it doesn't work. Take some time. But what you do is you're reconditioning your bed as a place of safety. Your bed is a place of sleep. It's not a place of frustration. It's not a place of worry. It's not a place of fear. It's not a place of, you know, being up. Mm. That's huge right there. Cause you're connecting. I see this. You're connecting. It's almost like a trauma response in bed. Exactly. You're connecting it to all the things that your brain's looping on when you can't sleep. A hundred percent. And whether you're aware that that's happening or not, it doesn't make a difference. It's happening. Because if you're you're like our body, we love routine and we anchor places with feeling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. Like if you walk into like a cathedral in Europe, there's a certain feeling you get just walking into the building because there's emotion, the way that it's, it looks, and that happens with our spaces and our places, and especially bed. Bed is like, this is, you know, and so, and then people can develop like sleep envy, their partner sleeping and they're up and they're like, what the, what the, I, know. I hate you, I hate you, stop snoring, wake up, right? Like it's a real thing. It's a real thing. So, so that is one of the mistakes. And when people really start to practice that, it makes a world, world, world of difference. Um, so the first one we kind of brushed over a little bit, but trying to force to control it, we do that through the through the P's, right? Subtly through all those P's. So it's just allowing sleep to happen, not viewing it like it's a problem, not trying to overly perfect it, not putting on a pedestal and, and, and thinking that all your challenges and everything would be resolved if you were sleeping, dealing with all that stuff, getting out of bed, not anchoring the bed with tossing and turning, frustration, looking at the clock. It's another big mistake people make because then you start to Okay, I only have three more hours and I got to get up. Okay, now two more hours. Okay, right? It's like, yes. why? Don't do that to yourself. Don't yeah. do it. Don't do it. So, you know, it's it's one of those things that just, it's not useful. So don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so another another mistake that people make is, and this is, this is a, a bit of a tricky one too. So I'm a big believer that you cannot improve what you don't measure. But what people do is they'll start to measure their sleep with an aura ring or a whoop strap or whatever, a lot of devices out there. And then they're getting all this feedback like, okay, your readiness score is low and your, your REM sleep is in the gutter and your deep sleep. And you're like, oh my God. And you start to freak out a little bit. Yep. And then what you, what that does is, well, I got to do something about this. I'm going to get some magnesium and I'm going to, you know, do all these things. And now it puts you right back in that spin of trying to, trying to fix it, trying to solve it, looking at it like it's a problem. It is valuable to measure and track your sleep if you have somebody to guide you through that process that understands it. It's not valuable if you're not sleeping well and you just keep getting the feedback that you're not sleeping well. And then all the things you try are not quote unquote working and it's reinforcing, oh, I'm broken. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to fix this. I'm trying all these things. So it reinforces this sort of like I'm a, I'm a, I'm broken, like mm -hmm. something's seriously wrong with me. Um, which then again, puts us in fear, doubt and worry, which then body responds, cortisol, adrenaline, which becomes a pattern. <laughs> so, um, so don't measure your sleep. If you're not sleeping well, I would say don't measure your sleep unless you're working with someone. Just like, you know, it's like you're not going to go and get blood work if you don't know how to read it. It's Yeah, it's it's useless information that could stress you out if you see, you know, at least knowing from my patients, you know, they'll see it. They don't know what it means and there's highs and lows and they're like, yeah. I'm dying. Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, like here's some things we can do. Like, right. So it's the same thing with, with measuring and tracking sleep. Definitely useful if you have support. Definitely not useful if you don't have support. So that's like, that is a mis the mistake is measuring, measuring your sleep without support. Like get support. If you need, if this is a real issue for you, if you're having a hard time, if it's affecting your life in a real way and get support, get support. You're not, there's other people that are going through exactly what you're going through. And there, I can promise you there is a way out of that. 
So many people struggle with their sleep silently. And then they develop this belief that like, oh my God, there's like seriously something wrong with me. I'm unique. Um, I'm alone. And you're not. <laughs> no, I, I can I can also attest to that. You are definitely not alone. I mean, I, I would say probably at, I mean, wouldn't you say like almost everybody at some point in their their life has a little bit of a period where there is some some sleep issues going on? A hundred percent. And it's like, okay, understanding that and, and, and understanding how to not make that a thing so it be, it doesn't become a decade long thing. Because literally the people that usually we work with, it's been going on for years, in some cases, decades. Mm -hmm. Like having, and, and it's it's normal to have some sleep issues. Like, like when you're going through those challenging times in life, whether it be menopause or whether 60% of women actually might even be higher than that. Um, experience insomnia while going through menopause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay, well, what can I do so that as my hormones are finding balance and as my body's kind of going through this metamorphosis? Yeah. So what can I do to support my body and mind to get through this metamorphosis so that it doesn't continue on after the metamorphosis? Right. That's the question to answer. Because it most likely there's more than a 50% chance that you're going to experience some challenging sleep, hot flashes, all the things that come along with the metamorphosis of that change. Um, yeah. So it is, hopefully that's helpful. So, so we're, we're kind of, you know, this, this stuff is once you see it, the cool thing about this, Dr. Krause is once you can see it and once you can help people see it, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you have a map. If you don't have a clear map and you're just like trying to do things and you're not really sure where you're going or if what you're doing is right, it, it's just so you feel stuck and, and you feel like, you know, a failure. And it's like, well, just, you know, open the map up, see the map. Okay. What's going on here? I can see it. That makes sense. Okay. Stop doing that. Okay. What's okay. So it's like just really having a clear map and understanding to then get back to again, allowing the body to do the most natural thing in the world, sleep. If you ask somebody that doesn't have sleep issues, what they do to sleep nine times out of 10, what do they say? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I just go to sleep. I just, yeah, I feel tired and I get in bed. Nine times out of 10, those people are actually doing things that would, that are not conducive to their sleep. They're, you know, on their devices, they're maybe having some alcohol, they're maybe not eating the best food and they're able to sleep. There's people that sleep on the side of mountains. There's people mm -hmm. that sleep in war zones. There's people that, you know, fall asleep while they're driving. Right. So it's like sleep happens. It can happen. It's just how we relate to it and what we do about it. You know, the relation and thought process thing really, really strikes me because, you know, like you said, you can sleep on the side of a mountain. So you've seen rock climbers set up their tents, right? Perched like, yeah. whoa, you know, and, oh. and what what would prevent me from sleeping at, on the side of a mountain? All the things going wrong with the ropes. All exactly. The I'm going to think exactly. all the worst case scenario. Did the, were the pintons in? Did I put, <laughs> I, did I put them in enough? Is, you know is that rope going to hold, right? All that stuff. And, and those climbers, they're actually able to sleep on the side of the mountain because they just trust. They, they get to a place of, okay, well, I trust. I've done this a million times. And they also accept that, well, if, if it didn't, you know, if I didn't put it in, then, you know, this is my choice to be on the side of the mountain. I'm dying doing something I love in the middle of the night. You know, so. Yeah, true. true story. It's like, yeah. So it really, our minds are, it's like, wow, it's so, the placebo effect. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a real thing. Oh my goodness. So let's hammer at home for a couple of folks that might be listening going like, okay, I'm not going to sleep on the side of a mountain ever. So that that's not going to go through my head. Mm. Let, let's share some stories like folks that you've been like, holy cow, they, they it finally clicked for them or you know, just yeah. some fun stories that you've gotten in your bank there of folk. Hey, Health Junkies, having been a former insomniac, I know how important sleep is for your health and daily performance. And when you can't sleep, 
The anxiety and frustration that shows up around bedtime can be intense. This is why I've partnered with Devin Burke and his Sleep Science Academy to help you end insomnia and sleep issues once and for all. How good would it feel to eliminate sleep anxiety? Stop waking up between 2 and 4 a.m. like clockwork. Feel rested when you wake up and not have to take handfuls of supplements or medications to do that. Devon's Sleep Science Academy is not another dial in your sleep hygiene program. It provides you with the support you need paired with cutting edge sleep technology to help you understand your sleep at a deep holistic level. Let's face it, most people spend $500 to $3,000 a year on supplements or meds for sleep. Not to mention all the lost productivity and being able to enjoy life to the fullest. Priceless. So, with their no risk money back guarantee, what do you have to lose but another night of sleep? Head to doctor spelled out J K R A U S E N D dot com forward slash E P four seven four to check out Devin's Sleep Science Academy. You've worked. Oh man, there's been so I have so many good ones. One of my favorite ones though was there was a gentleman, uh, his name's John, and I can say it. I, I'm not gonna say his last name, but he he, he left us a, a testimonial. I love his story. So he actually, just like most of our clients, tried all the things. They went to the doctors. They were on all the supplements. They were doing all the quote unquote right things, um, and he wasn't sleeping. And he really developed a lot of anxiety around it to the point where his wife actually had to drive him in the car in the middle of the night, that's the only place that he was able to fall asleep. Oh my gosh. What an amazing woman, right? Right. Like, what an amazing woman. Um, so, so we got him to for, get out of, you know, we broke that. We said, okay, let's, he couldn't get, he couldn't be in even in his bedroom. So we're like, let's just move you to a chair in your living room. And so we started to develop, okay, let's just anchor the chair with sleep, not the car in the middle of the night with sleep started to get it, started to reduce the anxiety. Okay. Let's, let's try going into the bedroom in the chair. And then eventually from the chair in the bedroom to the bed. So it went from car in the middle of the night, chair in the living room, chair in the bedroom, from the chair in the bedroom to the bed. And it literally, the, the process was the exact process of understanding, okay, what were all the stories that were keeping him so activated? We use the word activated versus anxious. Um, and, and understanding, okay, well, how do I deal with all that? How do I deal with my crazy mind that's telling me I'm going to die if I don't get sleep? How do I deal with, you know, the thought of tomorrow is going to be terrible. I'm going to be tired. I'm not going to, I'm going to have to call out of work. How do I deal with all that? So that it doesn't have my body be activated so that I can just allow myself to rest. And that took several weeks, but now he's, he's sleeping. Um, so that's one of my, I love that story just because it really does show you the power of when you really start to change your relationship to sleep, how it can really, you know, what a difference it can make. Um, another lady, she, she 30 years trying to figure it out 30 years. She was on medication for 30 years, not the same medication, different medications They had every you know, a couple of years or months, they would try different thing, whether it's, you know, Ambien or clonazepam, trazodone, they're all the, all the ones. And she was starting to, then they thought she had MS because she started to shake. She was a hairdresser and she wasn't able to work because she wasn't sleeping. She was on all these pills. And so again, same thing, took her through the same process Let's really change your relationship to sleep and also change some of the behaviors around sleep. Took a couple of weeks, got off all the medication, stopped shaking, didn't have MS. It was either a side effect of either not sleeping or a side effect of the medication. Was able to sleep after 30 years trying to figure it out on medication, cutting hair again, and uh, living her life. I mean, and she said, she was like, this is a miracle. I said, not a miracle. It's just understanding how to relate to it in a new way and then getting the support that you've been missing to then have your body do what it knows how to do, which what it doesn't need drugs to do, which is sleep. Wow. 
I can go on and on. We have like a ton of testimonials on our sure. website. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's for me, I mean, this, it, when I, I understand when somebody isn't sleeping, how important it is and how detrimental it can be right. to somebody's right. life. Um, and for those people that are listening to this that are really struggling, like go listen to some of those testimonials because it's going to give you hope and you're going to hear yourself in the other person. You're going to be like, Oh my God, like, yeah, I thought that, or, Oh, I, I, I think that, or oh, I do that. Um, and it'll give you the confidence and the hope that, okay, like you're not a lost cause for sure. You're not, everybody can sleep. Nothing too good to be true about sleeping. And I think that's important for folks to hear because I've had people come in and say like, I'm, you know, I'm just a lost cause. Just give me the, the trazodone, you know, I'm just going to keep taking trazodone. And I'm like, are you sure you want to keep doing that? Um, and, and this is the case in which, you know, we send them over your way and, and have them really start working through things because it seems like you've had folks, the, the last gal 30 years, she's tried different meds. She's probably tried all the heavy hitters. Heavy hitters, clonopin, trazodone, um, Xanax, Ambien. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think she said she was she over thirty years she tried like ten different medications. Oh, um, gabapentin, yeah. right? And so here's the th here's the truth about medication. Thank God we have it, and it's it can work. It's it's you know it's th these medications were designed to be used for temporary for temp temporary couple of weeks. Not for a couple of decades, not for a couple of years, at max, maybe a couple of months. But even then, it's like really most of them are, are, are supposed to be only prescribed for a couple of weeks. And it's like, I feel for the doctors. I get it because people are coming, they're begging, hey, please mm -hmm. refill this, please. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, these are, it's a Band-Aid. Most of them are sedatives. There's a difference between sedation and sleep. Mm. Mm, yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, the analogy is if somebody knocked you over the head with a baseball bat and you were passed out on the grass and then somebody else and you didn't, you weren't bleeding, you were just, you know, you were just knocked out and somebody walked by and you were kind of in a nice sleeping position, they might think that you were asleep and you are not asleep. You are unconscious, knocked out. There's a difference. You are, you know, and that's pretty much what these medications, most of them do mm -hmm. is they, they knock you out, but you're not getting into the deeper stages of REM sleep or Delta sleep for that repair, that mental, emotional repair, the physical repair. And so you will never really wake up feeling rested. And then what happens is you, again, you're kind of giving, I use the word, my language is you give your power away to a pill. And you believe I need to take this or I won't sleep, which isn't true because there's probably a time in your life where you're able to sleep without it. And so, yeah, sedation and sleep, two different things for sure. And natural sleep, there's nothing better than natural sleep. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, unfortunately, yes, we've got all the different war rings and watches and whoops and things telling us about the HRV and our sleep scores and our recovery. And we didn't recover. And like, I'm, I'm thinking about it just in my own self. And like you get up you and you hopefully everyone's not getting up and looking right on their phone, but when you does come to you, cause it alerts you and tells you your, your new sleep score is ready. Right. You're like, Oh my God, what do I do? And here, here's the truth. Like the first step too would be, let's just focus not on the quality of your sleep, Let's just get you sleeping enough. Mm -hmm. The quantity of your mm -hmm. sleep. Let's let's get you sleeping enough. Enough for you might be if you're sleeping currently three or four hours, might be six six and a half hours. Mm -hmm. That might be enough, mm -hmm. right? And then you focus on well, how can I make that six and a half hours the highest quality six and a half hours it can be without over focusing on it. That's. Okay. And then it's like, okay, well, maybe you're you're sleeping five and a half hours and you're really like an eight-hour person. Well, let's get you to eight hours. And then let's focus on how, how can we make those eight hours the best eight hours they can possibly be, again, without over-focusing on it. Mm -hmm. Do you do you think, this is another thing people over-focus on is the timing, right? Do you think that that eight-hour statement 
of like everyone should be getting eight hours of sleep. Do you feel like there's that's more individual than really that everyone should have eight hours? Because I feel like it is. It's total myth. Eight, eight hours is a myth. Some people need nine. <laughs> Some people need le- way less. Some yeah. people need, you know, people get away with in a, in a healthy way, six and a half. Mm-hmm. You know, the National Sleep Foundation says between seven, seven and nine hours, mm-hmm. really seven and eight hours, but some people, mm-hmm. depending on their stage of life and what you're going on, we got going on because that your, your sleep architecture changes with your lifestyle. If you have more stress, you're going to need more sleep. If you're going through a, a transition in life, maybe, you know, menopause or physical transition, you got, you're, you're sick, you're going to need more sleep. There's so that it's going to change your, your sleep architecture is going to change as you age, as you go through life, um, as things change. So it's really important to people for people to be mindful of that. Like you might not need eight hours. You really might not need eight hour and thinking that you do. And if you're not like an eight hour really sleeper is going to create all this stuff of like, Oh my God, I need eight hours. I'm only getting seven. And you know, I heard, Dr. So-and-so say, I'm going to, uh, get Alzheimer's if I don't get eight hours. And you know, it's like, whatever it is, right. It's like, um, yeah. So, and everyone's, you know, everyone's chronotype is also different. So certain people, it, you know, it really is very helpful to go to bed later yeah. and it's not really conducive for our society and our work schedules or our partner schedules. Cause you might be married to, uh, your, your partner might be you know, like a night owl and you're like a morning person and you're going to bed at like, you know, nine 30 and they're going to bed at like 1130. Maybe that's not, you know, it's not really conducive or if you have, to, you have a nine to five and you have to get up and commute and you're more of a late night person, then you have to get up early. So it's, there are things you just do the best you can. Yeah. You, no, do, you do the best you can. And you try to be as consistent as possible too with, with your sleep schedule, that, that does help. I think consistency is, is important. And then going back to kind of all the, the different things you're teaching. Now you've alluded to a lot of things about the Sleep Science Academy, what you guys have got going on in there. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about it so folks can kind of get a, a full picture sense because it sounds very different than other sleep programs that I have talked about with other folks, not on the podcast, but just in general, in terms of what someone else is up to in, in their stuff. So, yeah. So a lot of people focus on like sleep hygiene and maybe they do more of like CBTI type of, we do incorporate some of that. I think there's a time and a place for it, but what I found is really, there's a couple missing pieces. There's it's timing matters, like order matters. And if you get the order wrong, it can actually do the complete opposite of what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, so sleep science Academy, it's an, an eight week online sleep coaching program. And we really focus on helping people change the relationship to sleep and the, and stop the behaviors that keep sleep from happening. And a couple, we do that in a unique way. It's one, it's through education. So there's, um, training modules it takes about an hour to th- sometimes three hours a week to go through the modules to actually learn educate yourself on some of the tools, the techniques, the mindsets. So that's a big piece of it. It's like understanding what's actually going on. Then it's getting the support and support is so important. Um, So we have coaches once a week that jump on uh, calls, coaching calls with our clients, check in with them to personalize their program, to really understand what's going on for them personally. And then once a week, we have a group call. And this is great because people really get to hear themselves and other people get to really experience that they're not alone, get to really understand that, you know, they're not unique, they're unique, but what they're experiencing is not unique. And all of that is really important. And that also is a really big component to what it is we do. It's, it's helping people not feel alone and help helping them understand that they're not broken through the power of community. So that's a core element. And then we do, we do measure and track our clients, uh, sleep. And, you know, for some people, we, there, there's a lot of coaching around, Hey, don't even check it. Like, we're just going to let us do our job. Don't check it. If it's, if it's useful to check it, great. If it's not, then you're not, but let us, let us see that information so that we can, as a team 
work together to continue to help you make progress. And so that's, that's what we do at Sleep Science Academy. That's cool. So what's the, what's the, what are you using to track? What's your device that you guys have? So we, in the past, we were using Aura Ring. We were actually in the process now of beta testing a new device uh, hmm. called Ultra Human. Oh. Yeah. And so they're kind of like the Aura Ring in Europe. They're kind of making their debut here in the US. Um, what I really like it, about that specific device is they also have a CGM, hmm. continuous blood glucose monitor, which is really cool. Um, not necessary, but it's it's interesting, and you can kind of start to to see how how other as physical food stress how that affects insulin and how that can affect sleep. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what we use. The Aura Ring's great. It's great because it's non-invasive, yeah, small, and it puts. Here's the thing with devices: they're not no device is really 100 percent accurate, mm -hmm. but we're looking for precision. Mm -hmm which is consistency in the data. And if it's consistently off by whatever it is, then at least we have, we can see the improvement. Um, but, but I always tell people don't, don't hyper focus on the actual data and the numbers because it's not a hundred percent accurate. What you're looking for is improvement over time with consistency. That's this makes sense. And yeah, I would agree, like whether it's HRV, whether it's, you know, anything you're looking at, yeah. it's good to have someone have an eyeball on it. Like you said a couple of times in the podcast is having someone with the eyeball that knows what, what to do with the information. So when someone comes into the Sleep Science Academy, so they are getting linked in with the coach or somebody that's going to monitor them yep. and then work, work with them there. So they've got one-on-one -on -one contact with this individual throughout the course of the eight weeks. Yeah. And that's really important. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I feel like the group support and the one-on-one -on -one support over the years, we've actually tested just having one-on-one -on -one support, just having group support. And we just found the combination of both is mm -hmm. just so helpful. Um, because, you know, some people don't want to bring certain things up in a conversation in a group and, and then some people it's really powerful and important for people to feel like they're a part of a group and understand that they're not alone. And there is other people in the world that are going through exactly what you're going through uh, and kind of hear yourself and, and other people. So we, right now, the way that our program is set up is the focus is on both. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think that's good. And one of the things that, you know, like a lot of people don't want to talk about in terms of sleep stuff is the waking up to eat at night. Yes. You know, the blood sugar stuff connected. So that's cool that you've got the CGM there. Yeah. And we don't do that. So we're just, just to be Possibly. totally transparent. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're not, we're kind of just in the beta testing. Hey, like what, what is that going to look like? Um, but we're right now, yeah, that's not part of what we're doing. Okay. It's maybe a future thing that might be an option if people are interested in it. Cause the thing is not everybody wants to measure their, you no. know, stick themselves with a CGM and some people would be happy to do it. But so we're kind of exploring, Hey, how are we going to incorporate that? Uh, or are we going to incorporate that in what we do as an option? Gotcha. Gotcha. But it is, you know, you're seeing, and because of kind of thinking about, it, I'm seeing, I'm getting at the idea that you're seeing folks are waking up in the middle of the night quite a bit and having like interesting things of that nature, because that's really where a lot of people in my practice will be like scared to tell me like, yeah, I wake up and have to eat every night. <laughs> you know, and then they're like, yeah, yeah. Or people that we hear all, like people say, I have to eat right before bed, which mm -hmm. isn't ideal because you're not, you know, it's, that's definitely getting in the way of sleep quality. Mm -hmm. Um, some people eat in the middle of the night because it's comforting. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, it feels good to eat something. If it kind of like takes the edge off or some people actually need to eat something because their blood sugar is all over the place and that's why they're waking up. And then their mind starts going and it's like, okay, well, let's deal with the, the, the blood sugar and the mind. Um, let's get you stable, get your body in, in uh, homeostasis and your mind in homeostasis, both. Oh, that's perfectly said. The mind in homeostasis. I'm, I'm kind of hunching that that for most people in the case of sleep, it's not a deficiency per se. You might have magnesium deficiency. You might have, might need a little melatonin, but it's more homeostasis of the mind. I would say, I mean, here, here's the thing. Like I might be a little bit skewed because I'm getting the, the people that we get are kind of the ones that sort of have been through all the things and now they're getting referred to us or they're continuing to search and then they find us. Um, so it might be a little bit of a, a <laughs> skewed perception from that point of view. And 
almost everyone I've talked to. And at this point, literally I've talked to thousands of people, coached thousands of people. There's always a mental component, whether you're aware of it or not, there always is. I mean, it's both it's physical and it's mental. It's where we can't take our head off our body. Um, and so I think as a society, it's a lot easier to us, for us to focus on the physical because mm -hmm. we can feel it, we can touch it. When we're working with the mi mind, it's not really tangible. So mm -hmm. it's, it becomes this thing that's like sort of mysterious or not understood. Um, it's much easier to kind of, you know, work with things that we can touch and we can feel and we can see versus, mm -hmm. you know, thoughts. You can't really see thoughts. Um, at least I can't. So, you know, it's no. a little bit of a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't developed that skill yet. Maybe someday. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on it. I, sometimes I feel like I can, but, but most of the time, no. Yeah. So, so I got to ask, um, those of you who are listening to the audio version of this, Devin has these really cool blue light blocking glasses on. And I got to mm. ask, well, where'd you get those? Those are pretty schnazzy. And do you oh, recommend wow. them to folks? Okay. So I'm <laughs> going to give you the full shot. So I do. So actually, so I am now a good friends with the owner of this company, but before I became friends with them, one of someone on my team told me, Hey, like she had really bad migraines and she bought a pair of these and she said it really helped. And, you know, companies send me all kinds of stuff, test this or promote that or whatever. And I'm like, all right. Um, and so they, this company actually reached out to me. They sent me a pair of these. I put them on. I'm like, wow, I'm behind lights all day long, computer all day long. And I really did notice a difference in the, just the quality of like how my eyes felt. And so they have, it's, they're called Viva rays. And this is what's really cool about the technology. So they have these three lenses where mm -hmm. you can magnetically put, um, and this is again, so this is like, so these would be right before bed, like completely uh -huh. red. Yeah. And then these are supposed to be like when the sun starts to set, if you're still behind a computer or whatever. Um, and then these, the ones that I'm kind of wearing are the just like the daytime computer glasses, if you're in front of like lights and, and here's the thing, like, again, you can over focus and over be hygienic and over all that stuff, but support yourself. Like it's not normal to be behind lights in a computer for eight, nine hours a day. It's not, it's just not. Um, so if you, if you're, if you choose to do that and you're not taking breaks and looking at the sunset or, or waking up with the sun, then getting some really high quality, um, blue blocking lenses, it's supportive for sure. Nice. Nice. I'm always curious. And yes, you know, like we said before, we could get super granular on this and get obsessed, but we can also find things that do help us and kind of get the holistic approach, which is definitely how the homeostasis of the mind. I, I love that. I'm, I'm going to quote that. Um, <laughs> that comes into the whole picture. So I love how you're taking everything into account here, Devin. So tell everybody where they can find you, how they can get, you know, in touch with you guys to jump into the sleep science Academy and all of those good things. Yeah. So we can, we can put links below, um, this recording for, for, for anyone that's interested, uh, for our website, uh, sleepscienceacademy.com. Um, and yeah, we, we do a consultation with people, but honestly there's, we created after so, so many years, um, we just said, we put together a four minute video that pretty much explains all the things that we do, why it's unique, nice. why it's different, why it works, uh, in four minutes. And that's on our website and, and on our landing pages. And just watching that video, you'll kind of understand, okay, this is what it is. I get it. Um, and then you can make a decision whether or not it's for you or, or you, you want the support. Makes sense. Makes sense. Oh, that's cool. I like that you get the video to kind of condense it for folks too. And of course, guys, hopefully you've got a pretty good idea of what Devin is up to in the Sleep Science Academy here on the podcast as well. Devin, thank you for coming on and sharing all about the Sleep Science Academy and the Viva Rays. These are fun. These are fun, guys. I'm going to yeah. make sure we uh, get a little link to that so that you can see what those look like too. Awesome. Thanks, Devin. Thanks for coming on again. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. 
And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out J K R A U S E nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.